What's happening, everybody? Happy Saturday. Welcome into an all new episode of the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack a Day podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you would be so inclined. Make sure to like, comment, give those five-star reviews. If you're listening on an audio podcast, check into the Packaday podcast memberships over on YouTube. A lot of different ways to support the Packaday podcast, but most importantly, the best way to support is by coming and listening, and I really appreciate you doing that and always enjoy talking Packers with you. So thanks for allowing me the platform to do that. Let's jump into the tape from Packers-Lions because it was a ton of fun. Probably the game I was most excited about jumping into the tape. Thankfully, the All-22 came early. It was like a Thanksgiving Day miracle, and I got to jump into it right away. And the first thing that I want to note here before we get into the grades and everything else, let's start with just kind of some basic film review and kind of some of the things that I saw. The number one thing on my list I wanted to discuss today is this win was legitimate. They played fantastic. And were there some things that they still need to clean up and get better? Yes, we'll talk about those. But there was nothing in this game that I went, you know, when I'm going back and watching it being like, man, did they really get away with some stuff in this one? And usually when we talk about like when you go back and you watch the All-22, it's never really quite as good as it seems. It's never really quite as bad as it seems. There's always a level of truth to that. But I mean, man, Green Bay had to go in to their film room with their coaches and feel pretty damn good about what they put on tape this week. I thought, and we talked about yesterday and we talked about it in the pregame show, from a trenches standpoint, Green Bay got their face punched in in week four against the Lions. Apparently they took that personally because it was so different from earlier in the year. And they really fought back. They punched back. They took it to the Lions. And I really think it, it can sometimes be just like hyperbolic of, right, well, we're going to get the ball and we're going to take a deep shot down the field and we're going to set the tone in this game. Okay, there's a lot of football to be played left after that point. But I legitimately think that Green Bay set the tone in this one and they had a, we're going to come out and punch you in the face mentality. We're going to block things up front. We're going to hit those deep shots down the field and we're going to be here you know, pestering you all day long. And that's what it was. And that's that's an easy thing to say in the meeting room during the week of we're going to set the tone early and ah, you know, coach speak. They did it. They set the tone early and they kept it going throughout the course of the game. So number one takeaway for me in this one is this was not a fluke. This was not a Lions coughed it up. Like, and I was very honest and transparent with you guys about the Chargers game. I love that they got the win. I thought there were a lot of positive takeaways, especially from the offensive side of the ball from that Chargers game. But I thought the Chargers gave them every opportunity to win that game. And it did feel a little bit fluky. This one wasn't. This one was real. This one was legit. They earned it. I still think Detroit's a very good football team. I think they're going to give a lot of teams problems the rest of the year. I think they might be going through a little bit of a rough patch right now, which a lot of teams, especially a team like the Lions, who it's not like they've had a lot of success in their, you know, storied history to kind of lean in on. Those things happen, but it doesn't make the games any easier when you go into Detroit on Thanksgiving and have to find a way to win those games. Green Bay did. Credit to Matt LaFleur. Credit to the coaching staff. They deserve a ton of that credit because I thought their game plan was amazing. I thought the mentality they went in with. So many guys missing. This could have been a game where you just kind of mail it in and be like, well, you know, it's going to be tough. We're on a short week. We don't have half of our guys. Like, we'll just do our best. No, they brought it to Detroit. They went to win. They got away with the win. It was a clear and decisive win. No, it only says what seven point win at the end. It was, it was a better win than that. I know they got the, you know, sort of garbage time touchdown at the end. I also thought Green Bay did leave some points on the board, which has been an issue of theirs, something they still need to get cleaned up. But this was a really great film to go back and watch. And it it showed everything that we saw live, in my opinion, was legitimate in this one. Now, if you want to go over some of the hiccups, I did feel like there were some missed opportunities to hit some kill shots in this game. A couple of Christian Watson plays. Now, I'm not talking about from a Jordan Love standpoint. I'm talking about like they didn't block it up up front. There's a shot late in the game to Christian Watson where, you know, Love probably still needs to be better on the throw regardless, but Josh Myers gets beat in the middle of the line right away, puts a ton of pressure on Jordan. Jordan can't step into the throw. He's got to fade away, throw it sidearm, and it misses Watson by a bunch. There's another play where they run a long developing play. I talked about this one a little bit yesterday, where Watson is coming out of the backfield and beelining up the field. And if that is blocked for a second longer, not even a half second longer, Love has an explosive play down the field to Christian Watson. 
There's the play where Love throws to Jaden Reed all the way cross field. And it looks like it hits Reed in the hands and he kind of alligator arms it maybe just a little bit and ultimately ends up being complete. That's a big play that they could have had. Um, you've got the Romeo Dobbs drop where it was a first down. Love threw it right to him. Easy completion. Should have continued the drive. And instead, it's a big drop that gave the ball right back. You had the fourth and one where A.J. Dillon goes the wrong way. When we talk about this still being a young team and this volatility and these mistakes are going to happen, these are the sort of things that we're talking about. But it doesn't excuse everything else. It doesn't mean that you still can't play great football. It doesn't mean that you still can't be competitive. It doesn't mean that you still can't get wins against teams like the Lions on the road. And I think that's what Green Bay proved is you can still give some accident forgiveness to these young players and knowing that some of these mistakes are going to be made while you're cleaning it up and while you're getting better, but you want to see that competitive brand of football all throughout the year. We didn't always see that earlier. We saw a lot of mistakes and some non-competitive football. Now we're seeing some mistakes here and there, but fewer, and it's you know less likely that you're seeing them. They're fewer and far between, but you're seeing competitive football. You're seeing this team play just much more competitive and going against teams that are better than they were playing earlier this year and losing to. Now they're not only competing, but they're actually winning these games. So a couple snafus on offense. On defense, there were some players at times that were open in the secondary. I did think the pressure up front really relieved a lot of the stuff in the secondary and had Jared Goff had time in this game, I do think there were some even bigger completions to be had. There was a specific play that they ran against Green Bay's cover three defense. Once they ran it, uh, it was like, so basically it's a guy running a nine route on the outside, guy coming in motion and then running behind the nine route and running a deep uh, out route. Um, and they, they ran that two times. They ran it once to Laporta and once to Amon Ross St. Brown. And it goes for like 20, I think, probably somewhere around there both times. And it's stressing the hell out of Corey Ballantyne on the play. I, I'm not sure. Like, I, I think it's just a cover three beater, honestly. I'm not sure what Ballantyne can do any different. So what you end up happening is you've got corner deep, corner deep, safety in the middle of the field. And then Green Bay's bringing five on both plays. So I think Detroit maybe, you know, saw some things on tape where they could get Green Bay with five guys rushing, six guys covering. Because again, what happens is you've got your your three, you know, thirds of the defense, again, corner deep, safety deep, corner deep. And then you've got another uh, layer under that where your one of your corners is in the flat, your linebackers is, is in the middle of the field on a curl, and then your other, you know, linebacker is in the flat. So you've got flat, you know, middle linebacker uh, on a curl, uh, and then flat, and then the three guys running deep in their third of the field. But what's happening is they're running somebody, they're running like a running back out to this side. So that flat defender is coming up and taking the running back. And then you're running the nine route on the outside where Corey Ballantyne, that's his third of the field. He has to continue with that play. And then you're running a player right behind that nine route. The, the flat player is taking the flat guy. The safety still has to stay middle, deep middle. The other corner's you know, playing his deep third. And Corey Ballantyne, in both situations, has to cover the nine. And I think, I, I don't remember if they used like Jameson Williams or who they used, but that's a clearing route basically. But if he doesn't go with them, Jared Goff just hits him for a touchdown. It's like, it's going to be like a huge touchdown because nobody's covering that player deep. So he can't fall off of it to go to the deep out route. And now the deep out route's just chilling in no man's land wide the heck open. So they got to fix that and get that cleaned up. And like I said, I think it's just a cover three beater. Um, I'm not sure if the flat defender in that situation has to play back more and, and say like, hey, if you're going to take the check down, take the check down. But they got beat on it twice. And there were some plays like that where the secondary wasn't always communicating effectively. This team botched a few different um, like pass off attempts of, all right, they're going through your zone. You better pick that up. There were a lot of those things that happened. So a lot to still clean up in the secondary. Like I said, the pass rush really covered for a lot of that and still some hiccups on offense that you saw. Some of that stuff is going to happen. The other team gets paid too. It's a good football team. You knew they were going to come fighting back. They had some great game plan stuff for Green Bay and their defense. So give the Lions credit, but still some things to clean up. If you want to look at some of those things, those are the things that Green Bay can go and get ready for Kansas City and say, all right, we got the win, huge win, a lot of momentum to take off of this, a lot of positives to take out of this, but we still have some things that we need to get cleaned up on our end so that Kansas City who is known for their usually fantastic game plans, doesn't attack some of those same things that Detroit did. All right, let's jump into the grades because the grades are really, really fun this week. Top three players on offense. 
Jordan Love, number one, plus 2.85 grade. Highest grade any player that I gave this season. I will always tell you quarterback has more ability to fluctuate. Really good games are usually going to get graded really freaking well because there's so much opportunity and so many plays that they made. Really bad games can get graded really, really poorly. But this was a great game from Jordan. And my highest graded, like I said, player on the season for Green Bay in this game. Um, also my highest grade for a quarterback since Aaron Rodgers against the Cowboys last year in the Mike McCarthy versus Aaron Rodgers game where Rodgers was fantastic in that game. So I think uh, Rodgers was a plus 2.9 in that one. And Love was a 2.85 in this one. What I loved about Jordan, I mentioned it yesterday, is how, number one, how easy everything seemed. Uh, Brian Baldinger did a, a great breakdown of this uh, over on Twitter if you want to check that out, but just the ease with which he was throwing the football with. But it wasn't just the ease with which he was throwing the football. It was the ease with which he was finding his open receivers. He constantly knew where to go with the ball, how to attack the Lions, and just found the players open and then just took it. There wasn't any crazy like, all right, I've got an eight-yard completion here, but I might have a 20-yard completion on the other side. It's like, oh, I got an eight-yard completion. Let's take that. Oh, I've got a deep breaking in route. Let's take that. Oh, I have a shot to Christian Watson down the field. Let's take that. He was finding open receivers, deep, intermediate, short, all of it. And he was completing them with poise and accuracy. No turnover-worthy plays, which is always going to be beautiful for a quarterback. A um, couple plays that could have been made by his wide receivers. The Romeo Dobbs one is a great example of that. That would have been you know, added even to his completion percentage and yardage. Um, the throw down the field to Jaden Reed that we talked about, that's another one where I think Jaden Reed's got to find a way to come up with that ball. Thought it was a beautiful ball from Jordan. Could it have been slightly closer to, to, you know, to Jaden? Sure. You've got the incompletion to Christian Watson, where it looked like there had probably been some pass interference on that play that goes uncalled. And it was just read after read after read of knowing exactly where to go with the ball, throwing it in the place that it needed to be, letting his playmakers do the work, avoiding any sort of crazy pass rush up front, and you know, utilizing his, his legs when he needed to, getting out of the pocket, buying time. There's a play all the way across the field to Malik Heath, an amazing anticipation throw over the middle to Malik Heath. He had everything. He was completely in his bag on Thursday. And it's hard to find anything to complain about. I think the only thing that I mentioned that I think was probably a poor decision was that throw all the way across the field to Malik Heath. And he threw that so perfectly that you can't even be mad at it. He, he never put it in harm's way. Like it is only where Malik Heath can get it. And he threw it with pinpoint precision to the point where Heath can go up and get the ball. The defender has no chance at it. And it's a good completion. That's his, wor like his worst play of the day because he had a better check down option, said, ah, screw it, and went down the field and took the shot instead to Malik Heath on the exact opposite side of the field. Great decision? No. Amazing execution? Hell yeah. It was a beautiful day from Jordan. His best game as a Green Bay Packer. So much to build off of. Um, and just a, a really impressive performance overall. And I think something that really announced his presence as the starter of Green Bay moving forward. And I don't know how you can't be excited about what he put on tape this past Thursday. Number two, Christian Watson, plus 1.05 grade. This is the Christian we were waiting for. And I mean, just play after play, right? It, you, we talked about the play where he, the pass interference that probably should have been pass interference, which was a great play by Christian to get open. And the defender, I think, trips him. You have the play down the field that I mentioned that Jordan uh, you know, missed on because Josh Myers got beat right away. That's probably going to be a 50-yard touchdown if Myers has his handles his block up front, and fortunately, Myers doesn't. Those are two huge plays that should have been that didn't even go on the stat sheet for Christian Watson. You've got the awesome contested catch to start the game. He comes back and takes a slant at, for like an eight yards where he got walloped on the play, hung onto the ball. You got the toe drag swag on the side of the field. Like it was just, it was beautiful from Christian. And again, he, there was stuff left out there, not due to Christian, but due to a bad call and Myers getting beat at center. Otherwise we might be talking about like a 180 yard, two touchdown day, or at least a touchdown day, maybe two touchdown day for, for Christian Watson. This was really, really impressive. This is exactly what we've been waiting for. This is the bar moving forward. I think Christian just needed this boost of confidence. Hopefully this gave it to him. He is far too talented of a wide receiver to have like three catches, 30 yards or something game after game. 
this should be closer to the expectation for Christian. This is the type of talent that he is, and I want to see more of this from him moving forward. Awesome, awesome game from Watson. And then everyone's favorite, Malik Heath. Malik Heath, number three, plus 0.55 grade. I talked about him yesterday as well after my initial walkthrough of the, the tape. Man, he in very limited snaps. I want to say he played under 20 snaps in this game. Ends up with four catches, um, all of which were pretty darn good and went up and made physical catches at the point of attack. Impressive day in that regards. And then you've got a couple just awesome blocks that are on tape. Dusty evely has got one that he's got posted over on Twitter where he takes, I think, a corner of safety and drives him five yards downfield on a run play. There were a couple like that. There's a play where he loses his helmet and he seals the edge on a toss play. Like, just a really fun performance from Malik Heath. So he continues to get better and grow. And it, uh, again, in very limited snaps for Malik, he made a pretty big impact, both as a blocker and as a pass catcher, easily his best day as a Green Bay Packer so far. Bottom three, I want to start by saying this. The bottom three, number one, we'll talk about first, actually. We'll, we'll talk about John Runyon Jr., negative 0.4 grade. Again, lowest graded player on the season is in the bottom three pretty much every single week. Can probably put him on there next week too if he starts again and plays consistently. And in the meantime, and we'll talk about this one in just a moment, Sean Ryan plus 0.45 grade in his limited snaps this week. Looked awesome. Had a great snatch and uh, grab where he just throws a guy to the ground. Had another play where he, on the in his very first play, Aiden Hutchinson comes inside and rushes him and Ryan just stones him. And I mean stones him. And I fully expect if Ryan would start and play a full game that there are going to be some some you know issues. Like it's not going to go perfect. But it's been far from perfect. You know, Ryan is by far and away my lowest graded player on the year. By far and away, it's not close. And you continue to go with him despite there seemingly, you know, seemingly a, a better option on the roster. It's time for Sean Ryan. And Brian Bulaga agreed with me. I posted it's Sean Ryan time on Twitter. Brian Bulaga quote tweeted it saying that he's been trying to tell Tauscher the same thing. It is time for Sean Ryan. He needs to not only play, he needs to start. Give him a game. If it sucks, if it doesn't go well, fine. So be it. Go back to running if you want to. But Ryan is under contract next year. He seems to be the better player. Third round pick, top 100 pick. Get him on the field. Give him his opportunity. I think he's going to get better week to week. But tough game for uh, for John Running Jr. again. My two other negative players, I want to be clear here, are basically like neutral level players. Usually these guys would not even show up in a bottom three with their grades that they had. But Green Bay's offense played so well and had so few bad performances that again, there has to be three that are the lowest in some capacity. So Yash Nyman, negative 0.15. This is a, what I'll say is it's there's always going to be different viewpoints on things. PFF had Yash Nyman as one of their higher grades this week. So um, I did not think Yash was quite as good in this one. I But I, like I said, it has a slight negative grade. It's a neutral grade, basically, negative 0.15. It's a solid day. Nothing that you're going to be upset about. Just so happened that everyone else played really well. So he ends up as the second lowest grade. And then Patrick Taylor, same thing, negative 0.1, barely played, um, had a couple of nice blitz pickups, had a couple of plays that he'd like to have back, nothing egregious. And you, you know, for a guy that got picked up on the practice squad with a negative 0.1 grade, that's basically a neutral grade. No worries, no harm, no foul, no concern, let it go. And uh, you, you, we don't even really need to talk about it. So really it was Runyon on offense with maybe a couple of plays here or there from Nyman that he would have liked to have back. But overall, not not bad grades on the offensive side. And Watson, Love, and Heath, just monster grades this week, specifically Love and Watson. And really, Heath on a per-play basis, 0.55 positive with the very minimal snaps played. Really, really great day from him as well. Some other noteworthy ones on offense, Ben Sims plus 0.25. He continues to get better as a blocker. Really like Ben Sims. I'm shocked Minnesota just let him go. Really smart of Green Bay to claim him. I think he's got some of that long-term blocking potential with some ability to leak out. I think he's going to be a Packer for a while. I really do. I think Green Bay found something there. Tucker Craft plus 0.00, a literal neutral grade this week. I love the touchdown play that they designed for him. I thought he did some good things. Had a couple plays where he blocked really well. A couple plays where he did not block very well. This is the life of a rookie tight end in the NFL. But for his first start, neutral grade, you'll take it. You'll move on and he gets the touchdown. Some positive plays. I would have loved for him on the crossing pattern where it was like third and eight and he got seven yards. And then that was the next play where it was fourth and one and Dylan didn't get it. I would have loved to have seen him find a way to get the first down on that one. I thought it was there for him. I thought there was an opportunity for him to pick up the first down. Good play by the linebacker, but 
in time, Kraft's going to beat that easily and find that first down marker and get there. Uh, but overall, neutral day for Tucker Kraft. Elton Jenkins, I just wanted to shout out that he was a plus 0.35 again. I think fifth straight week now with a really positive grade, continues to play really impressive football. Zach Tom, usual, Mr. Consistency, plus 0.15 grade. I, I'll say the same thing I said yesterday. Tom got beat a few times by Aiden Hutchinson, but he got beat playing one-on-one -on -one and he didn't have a ton of help against Aiden. And that's a really tall ask of any offensive tackle in the league because Hutchinson's really freaking good. And Tom battled with them all day long. Tom had his share of wins against Hutchinson one-on-one -on -one as well, ended up as a net positive. And any day where you are one-on-one -on -one with one of the better edge players in all of the league, and you end up with a slight positive grade, that is a huge, huge impact and a huge win for your team. Because we've seen players like that can just wreck the entire game. I don't know, like Brashawn Gary did on the other side of the ball. Zach Tom held in there, battled all day long, really impressive day, even if the grade was only a plus 0.15, because Hutchinson, of course, is going to get his as well and going to have a couple plays. But overall, really positive day. And then Sean Ryan, plus 0.45 grade, as we talked about, needs to be the starting right guard, make it happen, Green Bay and friends. Top three players on defense. Not only did Green Bay have their highest graded player of the year, they also had their highest graded defensive player of the year, Rashawn Gary, plus 1.95 grade. Three sacks, two forced fumbles, fumble recovery, multiple stops in the running game. Big, big time game from Rashawn Gary. Game wrecker, game changer, coming off the ACL that he tore at Ford Field a season ago to just a little over a year later, and he's wrecking the game entirely from the defensive side of the ball. Awesome, awesome performance. We've seen Rashawn get pressure and make an impact and just be a menace, but this was pressure making an impact, being a menace, and also making those big explosive plays. This was having your cake and eating it too for Rashawn Gary. Big time performance. Need, like it, love it, want more of it. Um, hopefully he continues to wreck games like that. He is a absolute nightmare for opposing offenses and really showed it in this game. Kudos to his uh, running mate on the opposite side, Crescent Smith, plus 0.85 grade. Had a ridiculous spin move on Penny Sewell. That resulted in a pressure where Goff has to step up. Carl Brooks cleans it up. Sack, fumble, fumble recovery, Packers ball. Had another play where he comes around, goes right by Sewell, force fumble, fumble recovery. They called it an incomplete pass. I don't care. Awesome play by Preston Smith. Big time game. He's playing better and better. Thought he set the edge well in the running game. Preston Smith quietly really coming along and having a very nice season. Kenny Clark, plus 0.75 grade, Mr. Consistency. He has a play on tape where he bench presses the guard like 10 yards into the backfield. Unbelievable stuff. Has a couple other plays where he just wins with ease. He's playing at a high level right now. The rumors of Kenny Clark's demise are greatly exaggerated, and he continues to play really, really good football. Love watching Kenny play week in and week out. Bottom three. Unlike on offense, where there weren't really any poor performances, there were a decent chunk of poor performances. It was This was probably one of the crazier games that I graded um, on offense or defense, and specifically on the defensive side of the ball for this one, is the amount of players that graded really well in this game were a ton, but there were a lot of players who had some bad grades in this one. Led by TJ Slayton, negative 1.5 grade. He had a nightmare matchup in this one with Frank Ragnow. Frank Ragnow can not only match TJ Slayton's physicality and intensity, but Ragnow is an absolute technician and TJ Slayton is not. And that is advantage. Frank Ragnow, TJ Slayton could not get off of Frank Ragnow all day long. Ragnow was an incredible and Slayton had no way of getting off of it. And they moved Slayton in the run game. He couldn't get anywhere in the passing game. It was just it like, he was just basically might as well have just been there and he couldn't get anywhere that he wanted to on the field. Tough game for Slayton. He'll learn from it. He'll get better from it. But these have been two really tough weeks for Slayton, and he is not trending in the right direction right now. Isaiah McDuffie, negative 0.75. Thought he struggled in coverage. Thought he struggled as a run defender. Couple really instinctual plays here and there, but uh, also struggled to get off of blocks as he usually does. Um, I'm still Team Quay and Devondre at inside linebacker. I think they're a, a step ahead of Isaiah McDuffie. I know there's some Isaiah McDuffie believers out there. I like McDuffie, but I think he's a backup, and I think he showed it in this game. Didn't love this performance from him, um, but nothing. There was no like big play. He had the big penalty. That was the big one where 
He's got the, I think, I don't know if they call the legal contact or pass interference, but I think it was a big third down. Green Bay gets a pressure and it looked like it was going to be, you know, turnover, or at least, you know, they were going to have to punt the ball away. And instead, big penalty on Isaiah McDuffie and gives them a new set of downs. So just a couple of plays here and there from McDuffie. And then Corey Ballantyne, he got beat on a few different plays. He got beat on a deep crosser where, you know, he couldn't even, not only could he not stick with them, but then he wasn't even in position to make the tackle on the play. There were a couple other times where he got beat deep. There's a play late in the game where he gets beat um, on his side. And it's like the one thing you want to make sure is that you're not letting anyone get over the top of you in that situation. So a couple plays like that from Ballantyne, um, not brutal, but not good enough. And, and something that you just want to see him, especially just have some situational awareness late in games of like, you just can't give up big plays there. And he didn't, like they didn't throw his way, but there was the opportunity for them to get some bigger chunk plays had they had a little bit more time up front and had the ability to maybe exploit Ballantyne a little bit more than what he got exploited. Some other noteworthy ones, Carl Brooks plus 0.4 grade. I uh, thought he continues to impress with a big splash play almost every single week. Has the forced fumble and the fumble recovery in this one, which was obviously a huge play for him and a huge play for Green Bay. Thought he had another couple of nice pass rushes, but a couple of plays where, again, he's just not going anywhere and not getting off blocks in the run game. So still work to do for Brooks, but he's a really, really fun player. Thought Devontae Wyatt had a nice day. He beat some guys clean in the passing game, had some pressures. Um, you know, it still needs to get better as a run defender, still needs to finish some of those pressures into sacks, but I thought this was a good game from Devontae Wyatt. Kingsley and Igbari had probably his best day of the season. He also had a couple wins against Penny Sewell, which again, just very uncharacteristic for Penny Sewell. Quay Walker, negative 0.6 grade. I'm, I'm struggling guys with Quay and I think he is getting to his spots. I think he's fast. I think it's tough to sort of, um, you, you also don't want to go in the opposite direction to be like, this guy sucks or he's bad. But I know a lot of people are just like, man, Quay's really good. And like, I just don't see that. He struggles in coverage. He struggles in run defense. He can't get off blocks. He's a fine player and he's probably more of like a net neutral player. But I think a lot of people have this view that he's just like this really good inside linebacker. I can't quite get there yet with Quay. I like the potential. I like the upside, but he still has work to do to reach what I think Green Bay was hoping for when they drafted him in the first round. And then the one that I got asked about a lot, Jonathan Owens. Really nice day. Plus 0.55 grade. Uh, obviously has the big fumble return for a touchdown. Couple plays in coverage that he was late to. Couple plays in coverage and getting to the football as a run defender that he was right there. Johnny on the spot. 12 tackles on the day. 12 tackles, fumble recovery, touchdown. That's going to be a good day for a defender more often than not. Plus 0.55 grade for Jonathan Owens. If you want to know some grades for the season, my top three graded offensive players on the year are now Jordan Love, number one. Zach Tom, number two, Romeo Dobbs, number three, my bottom three on offense, John Runyon Jr., one, Josh Myers, two, Rasheed Walker, three, top three graded players on defense, Rashawn Gary, Kenny Clark, still Razul Douglas hanging out at number three, bottom three on defense, Keyshawn Nixon, Jair Alexander, and Isaiah McDuffie and LVN are actually tied for the third lowest grade on the defensive side of the ball. So, just to recap really quick, my top three on offense this week, Jordan Love, Christian Watson, Malik Heath, bottom three, Runyon, Nyman, and Taylor. Top three on defense, Rashawn, Preston, and Kenny Clark. Bottom three, Slayton, McDuffie, and Ballantyne. Top three on offense for the year, Love, Tom, and Dobbs. Bottom three, Runyon, Myers, and Walker. Top three on defense for the year, Gary, Clark, and Douglas. Bottom three, Nixon, Alexander, and McDuffie slash LVN. That's going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. Always appreciate you guys a ton. Um, make sure to check out Packaday Podcast memberships if you have not already. Uh, of course, we always appreciate our Hall of Fame and All-Pro members, Most Hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wilde, Che Bradad, Arnaldo Espinoza, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, and Lori Lord. You guys are the absolute best. I'll be right back here tomorrow with an all-new episode. Won't want to miss it. But until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go.